Welcome to the Open Hearted Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Open Hearted Podcast. I'm your host, Will Wheeler, joined with my main man, Photon John. Kev, what's going on, brother? Uh, you know, just suffering in 78 degree humidity. <laughs> 78% suffering, humidity. Yeah. Suffering. Uh, I feel for you, my man. Um, yeah. So those of you who may be listening overseas, we are now in the Australian summer. And when mm-hmm. it is the Australian summer, it is hot as so yeah. if you're in brisbane where photon john is the humidity up there is not the best so i yeah, feel probably. for you man it's gonna be 41 here in sydney on yeah. friday so yeah. i may be feeling some heat but then yeah. my parents are coming down on sunday and it's gonna be 20 degrees Oh, so what? a massive drop there, <laughs> eh? a massive drop. Literally half, wow. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. But I tell you what, we should really be um, thinking about our guest today. We've got all the way from the UK, and uh, we might just get him up on stage. My main man, Jonathan Levy. <laughs> I really struggled with that one then. Hello. <laughs> What's going on, my man? Thank you so much for joining right. us. Yeah, yeah. So I really had to stop and think. So for our listeners, Thank before, you for before Thank you Jonathan, you. yeah, not a problem. Before Jonathan um, came on, we're like, I said his name. I said, did we get that right? So I'm probably going to stuff this up. So when like you came on, we we did it and I got it. So yay to me. But thank you so much for joining mm-hmm. us, yeah? Thank you both for having me. So, like, I don't know. Um, I think there is a bit of a lag coming through. So, yeah. if we have a little bit of a lag today, don't stress too hard about it. Think about it as if we're doing like a live news thing and we're waiting for like the news reporter to come back to us. But it should <laughs> be all good. But to tell you what, for all of our listeners listening today, what we're going to be covering is self acceptance around dyspraxia. Now, before we get into that, I might just do a little bit of housekeeping here. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media platforms. We're on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitch, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And you can also check us out on the openheartedsociety.com. Please subscribe to our newsletter, check out our past podcasts, and please check out some of our past articles that we have written. John, John, you ready for this, brother? I am ready. We haven't, we haven't touched on dyspraxia a lot, so I'm, I'm keen to learn. Yeah, man. So, Jonathan, um, you know, I think, you know, before anything, you know, maybe share a little bit about yourself. You know, you're talking to us a little bit. You do a lot of stuff around fundraising and stuff like that. Really love to hear a little bit, little bit, uh, a little bit about yourself. And then, yeah, let's get stuck into this. Sure. Well, thank you again both for having me. I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of months or so now. I'm impressed by the variety of guests you have across the world, you know, Sweden, Scotland, Wales, obviously UK, obviously Australia as well. And I'm speaking to you today from a place which Will pointed out to me, some Australians might have heard of, uh, Rugby Town. I speak to you from a place called Warrington, where we have a team called Warrington Wolves. Uh, but the reason I'm here today, I'm 32 years old. I have a lifelong condition called dyspraxia has just been alluded to and dyspraxia i've long kind of regarded as almost like a forgotten relation say compared to conditions like autism dyslexia adhd and others dyspraxia in simple terms affects fine and gross motor skills so that's things like organization thought processing speech lots of physical things can be difficult Um, I myself was quite fortunate to be diagnosed from a young age, so like in my early childhood, and I absolutely attribute that to some extent because I grew up in a family of doctors, 
So I was quite blessed in the respect that that meant I got quite a lot of support, uh, which I didn't always like, but nevertheless, I got support in, say, education, school, etc. I always kind of knew I had this condition with disability, kind of knew I was different to some extent. Um, and then as I was growing up, you know, I did, I went to college, then I worked in politics, I volunteered in politics, I helped get a guy elected. Then at the age of 19, I got my first job in politics. This guy got elected as a member of parliament in the UK. Um, this really, the age of 19, was where I really suddenly realised how much dyspraxia does affect me, uh, which can almost sound quite negative, and it, maybe it was negative at the time in a way, uh, but that definitely was a start of me really, I suppose, taking dyspraxia in terms of how it affects me seriously. And ever since then, I've been on like a huge journey, if you like. So that was 2010. I wrote a newspaper feature uh, in Dyspraxia Awareness Week, which is a UK, well, it's actually international, but it came for UK Dyspraxia Awareness Week. It's an international campaign every year, say in October. And 2010, no, 2011, Dyspraxia Awareness Week, I was working in my parliamentary job, this member of parliament. He's not a member of parliament anymore. And I wrote this piece because I'd been so struck by how my condition affected me. And even though I was, this wasn't, this was more perhaps my conscious mind at the time, I was quite, I think I was definitely struggling uh, to some extent mentally because how dyspraxia had affected, was affecting me in this job. And what really kind of baffled me and frustrated me was this member of parliament who again, offered me a job, I didn't even apply for his job. He was an okay employer, but he was meeting constituents, the people in the local area, all the time who had autism, dyslexia, or their children had it, or so and so had it, their spouse had it, and they wanted him to kind of lobby, campaign over it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but here was me, who'd worked for him for like two years, uh, who told him from day one I had this condition called dyspraxia, and yet I felt like either he wasn't interested or it just didn't make sense to him. Mm -hmm. I felt a bit kind of stupid. So in my unconscious mind, the reason I wrote this piece, yes, it was to raise awareness, but ultimately, I think actually the person I wanted to have a biggest impression on was this guy I worked for, uh, the MP, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to kind of make my workplace situation better. Albeit, if that didn't really happen, he wasn't really that bothered by it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the public reaction to this piece was really big. Um, and it was that which really led to me then doing more kind of dyspraxia campaigning, some media work, becoming a trustee, which basically means like a board member of uh, the Dyspraxia Foundation, which is the UK's only charity dedicated to support people by dyspraxia. And as the years have progressed since then, again, I've done lots more work around dyspraxia. I've become in recent times Dyspraxia Foundation's first chair in its 35 year history to have dyspraxia. Um, so I've been in that role about 16 months and that's going very well. And mm -hmm. definitely dyspraxia has kind of become a big part of my life. And I definitely, I suppose, been on a journey in terms of how I feel about it over the years. So it's quite nice, really, that you've actually called this self-acceptance self, -accept, self -acceptance about it. Because I think, and I see this all the time, I think sometimes in our younger years, we're more all out there. Then we might perhaps feel a bit more resentment, if you like, a bit more negativity. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps mm -hmm. the older we get more balance we get and yes nowadays i work what pays me is i work in fundraising and i'm meeting neurodiverse fundraisers accidentally all the time nowadays as well yeah it's it's funny how it um i i, I don't know but like we seem to attract each other do you know what i mean uh and we seem to click pretty well with other neurodivergent people <laughs> you know um you were saying that um uh, the the workplace, uh, you know, the employer that you had, the MP, um, wasn't very phased about the article that you wrote. Pardon me. Do you think that maybe he was phased about it, but was trying to put on a bit of a a political sort of act in a way? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking because if if you got so much attention yeah. in the way you did, that's got to make some type of impact, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think I would probably say no to that because ultimately nothing really changed. Like basically mm -hmm. in that job, I was, you know, I know in any 
country, some people, well, I don't exactly know it's like Australia, but I can kind of guess. Lots of people think politicians, MPs, or whatever you want to call them in Australia, other country, are lazy, don't work hard. That is absolutely not the case. In most, you know, mm. overwhelmingly, whatever the country is, elected politicians do work very hard. And mm. Their diaries are absolutely packed. Um, and yeah, this guy I got elected, I helped get elected, who offered me a job. It's one of his staff. You know, he he wasn't a name, he wasn't famous or anything, but from day one, literally like his first week of being elected in May 2010, you know, his inbox was bombarded with stuff. Um, and that carried on, of course, being the case. Um, so my job was one of his parliamentary staff. You know, I'd be dealing with casework, I'd be responding to hundreds of literally hundreds of emails and letters every single week about all kinds of issues large and small meeting constituents going on visits etc and i could do that parliamentary work the so-called intelligence stuff if you like and i should also say again i don't exactly know what it's like australia but at least in the uk people have this idea they might not like politicians but they think of like politics as being like this high in the sky kind of thing uh, so when i got this job people kept telling me like wow and I wasn't doing it for a while or anything like that. People have this idea, like, politicians are almost, like, super intelligent, like, I can think, you know, different to them, which is unfortunate, really. Uh, but I could mm. do the parliamentary work. But where I really realised how dyspraxia was affecting me, and that it even was dyspraxia affecting me, was, as I mentioned, I would be responding to hundreds of letters all the time, and then, of course, printing them. So we have a state-of-the-art printer, and this printer would regularly get jammed. It would show you a diagram of how to fix it, and this diagram, no matter how many times it happened, this diagram made no sense to me whatsoever. So, of course, I had to get my only other colleague in the office to try and help do that. Um, so that was a bit frustrating for her. Then, it wasn't just that. Also, I think, again, a lot of people know that MPs, politicians, don't always sign their own letters. They get their staff to do it. I don't think I'm saying anything which is particularly super shocking. Mm -hmm. um, bit of fraud MP, happening there, right? Yeah, this <laughs> There you go. This MP actually banned me. This MP actually banned me from doing his signature because my writing was too childlike. Um, because lots of people dyspraxia, not everyone, but some people dyspraxia. Um, they hold, and I'm one of these people, they absolutely hold a pen lower down. So their grip is harder. Uh, they're having writers slower as well, which is kind of which is kind of why I said it's more childlike. It did look a bit like a child, to be fair. Uh, mm. But yeah, I got banned from that. Also, when it came to folding letters, so again, this is the so-called simple stuff. I've done the parliamentary work. I failed to print the letter. I've got banned from signing. Then it comes to folding and stuffing the letter in an envelope. Even that was really hard for me as well. Wow. And of course, my colleagues, uh, both in the other office, I was thinking, could kind of see this. And even though I disclosed from day one I had this condition, I just think it was the fact they were seeing it now in, in the real. And I suppose the other thing I'd attribute to this job is uh, politics, again, in the, I can't talk about it like Australia, but in the UK, um, working, you know, when you're elected as a member of parliament, you are suddenly an employer. Now, this guy I worked for had been an employer, but lots of MPs haven't been employers before. So there isn't your typical HR person or HR practice, if you like. And we were all really, including the MP, we were all really learning as we were going on. Uh, so this was quite a difficult experience for me. And I kind of knew all the colleagues were sort of bitching about me or like, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. Kind of thing. I'm, um, I'm assuming. Oh, okay, uh, final thing I'll say. Yeah. But I'm assuming that, like, you know, people would necessarily be just thinking, oh, he's not trying hard enough or do you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. that's sort of the the mindset I'm thinking some people would be like, oh, he's careless. He's not even he's not even trying hard enough. Do, do you know and, what and, I mean? And that can come from people who who you disclose to who say yeah, yeah, okay yeah. i am i am i i am taking this knowledge in i'm not judging you i accept this but with the lack of education they just don't their neurotypical brains don't know how to process it when they see it in action mm -hmm. and they attribute neurotypical meanings and ways of thinking to to what's happening um that cause them to have a lot of misconceptions about what is actually going on you know yeah totally totally so 100%. you've told us a little bit about so yourself was... Yeah. So, so you've told us a little bit about yourself. You've told us a little bit about your work, but are we able to maybe go a little bit more in depth into what 
dyspraxia is. You know, you've spoken about poor motor skills. Um, and when we were talking Absolutely. about stuffing letters, writing letters, um, oh, not Probably. writing letters, doing your boss's signature, which we probably should put on the the hush hush there, but, <laughs> but that's all good, all good. Uh, but um, yeah, so 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 what is it exactly? So let's pretend like I'm an employer who doesn't know anything about it. What would be you know? What do we need to know, or what would you like people to know about it? Sure. So the spread. It is uh, it simply affects fine and gross motor skills, which I do think that's like the so-called simple definition. But then I think a lot of people probably don't even know what fine and gross motor skills even means necessarily. Mm. Uh, so first of all, dyspraxia is a lifelong condition. Um, one thing I all, almost always say when people ask me kind of what dyspraxia is, I say it's basically kind of in the middle of autism and dyslexia. Um, so lots of people with these conditions have might have dyspraxia and dyslexia and autism or and even ADHD. Uh, in my case, I just have dyspraxia, not diminishing it, but lots of people do have more than one. But even so, even though I officially just have dyspraxia, you know, I still have some traits which might sometimes be linked to, say, conditions like autism and dyslexia. And the reason why I immediately mention those conditions when people ask me what dyspraxia is, is because they are like household names nowadays. Autism and dyslexia have for years been household names, and ADHD definitely now is awareness is so much greater now as to what ADHD is too. Um, so <clears throat> it relates to those conditions too. It can it doesn't affect intelligence, and uh, that's one thing that's important to note. So it's a learning yeah. difficulty rather than a learning, learning disability, though it is a disability. I think that's important to note because sometimes I do see these these phrases confused. Typically, it tends to, so in the 80s, I was born in 91, so before my time, but nevertheless, it used to be known as clumsy child syndrome which one sounds terrible Ooh. it sounds quite rude anyway clumsy child syndrome and mm, two it doesn't it just rude. affect children it's lifelong there's no cure mm. um yeah absolutely but definitely it used to be known as that um so over years um i guess like it's, it's, you know my perception of people's average view of say dyslexia is people think about a uh, bad at you know struggling in terms of reading or writing or spelling people's perception yeah. i think of and i'm saying perception doesn't always need the case perception of autism might be struggling with social skills and people's perception of dyspraxia has tended to be that clumsiness thing like falling over spilling things which mm. does apply um but actually you know i mean my coordination will always be poor of my peers but you know at the age of 32 mm. now i I honestly can't remember the last time I dropped something or spilled something, you know. So it's Were you good at sport? Again, there's lots of children who won't have a struggle with clumsiness. No. Wait, wait. So I was, but that's that's one thing. Lots of people with dyspraxia will be terrible at sport. I was absolutely mm. terrible at sport. And I was someone who often forgot my PE kit. Uh, I suppose I found it quite anxiety induced i mean anxiety wasn't really a word that was used back in those days but i probably did find that pe sport quite anxiety inducing but mm. there are people with dyspraxia who are great at sport mm. and mm. last year's dyspraxia awareness week kind of covered um sport physical education that sort of thing and we had people who were saying they loved rugby they did all kinds of sports jiu-jitsu all these kinds of things which to mm. me would be a nightmare um mm. but lots of people do struggle with things like sport people with affected dyspraxia organization is another thing which lots of people with dyspraxia struggle with um that can be literally keeping your desk or your you know your bedroom i suppose if you like tidy organized even organization to me i know where i live where i speak to you from right now i've lived here for like just over four years but if mm. you ask me to give directions i can't do it no matter how many times i try because mm. it's like too many cross wires in the brain essentially it's like too what much about in the brain what about uh, I, what about dressing like getting like I don't know, like, I'm just, so, and the reason why I ask, and I'm going to use my brother as this example, I'm pretty sure he's dyspraxic, and when we were growing up, like, he, say you grab, like, a bottle out of the fridge, he would grab a bottle out of the fridge and not realise that you need to hold on to 
that bottle and he'd just drop it and it'd smash all over the ground. His handwriting was like, you would say like, it looked like a kindergarten's handwriting way up until, it's a lot better now, but um, when we were in sport, he just wasn't the best. And, you know, when he would get dressed a lot of the time, he's a lot better now, by the way, I should say, you know, he would always be missing buttons or he would just, he was interest. He was an interesting dresser. Let's say that much. Is that a thing as well? Do you think? Yeah. Well, that, yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's one of the things I don't really mention dressing nowadays. I think because I'm just kind of so beyond it. But absolutely, yeah. When I was younger, definitely, I struggled uh, with you know doing buttons kind of thing. Even nowadays, like occasionally when I have to get particularly dressed up, like to go to go to a dinner, fancy dinner or whatever, like bow tie. I mean, look, some of these things, to be fair, can be difficult for the only one. But, you know, bow ties, whatever. Even doing a normal tie um, can be very difficult for me. I just tend to avoid it. Uh, but yeah, definitely dressing again, especially in younger years, can absolutely be be difficult too. And again, like like other conditions, I think the older you get, um, doesn't necessarily mean you you know you're absolutely never cured, but the, the, the way things can affect you can be can be different. So definitely in my younger years, I even though dyspraxia is not just clumsiness at all, you know I did struggle mostly probably with anything to do with coordination or anything at all physical. Um, then in my early working years, it was probably more around being organized, being on time to things, because lots of people with like mine struggle with timekeeping, that sort of thing. And now <clears throat> at the age of 32, so I feel like I'm probably into like another chapter of my working life now. I'd mm. say the thing I'm most aware of in terms of my condition is probably fatigue in terms of balancing things in my mind more um, in terms of being so, being so worked on balancing so many plates, got different titles, etc. cetera. Um, I definitely feel how I operate in terms of hours and times I work is often different to my peers. And that's okay. So like conditions can affect people the older they get in different ways. But yeah, dyspraxia is a spectrum. One other thing I like about dyspraxia is it can also affect speech too. And because, as I said before, I was lucky, I was fortunate to be diagnosed younger in life. I got occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy. Again, these things don't cure you, they help you get better. But even today, uh, even as I speak to you right now, I might be able to speak clearly, but I absolutely have to particularly focus on my pitch, my tone, and my intonation. And that's very common with people with dyspraxia mm. too. So it can affect mm. people's speech too. Mm. It's 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 interesting because listening to you, what you're speaking about, that sounds like my brother big time. I'm pretty sure when we were younger, he had big problems with speech. But this is the thing as well. Now that he's older, like he's almost 40, um, he, um, you know, I think he's definitely found a lot of... Um, would you say he's gotten better? Have you found you all got a, a lot better than what you were when you were younger? Man, we must have a bit of a lag there. Sorry, you're there. Can you hear us, mate? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I heard you say your brother he's found when he was younger. And, uh, uh, and so, so he, had, he seems to... I've found like um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like he, he's 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 not like what he used to be. So it's like yeah. he's has improved over the years, or he's found um, coping mechanisms to to uh, you know what I mean? Like for one thing, you know he's a salesperson now, and he's really good at it. So maybe that has helped him to potentially you know, deal with some of these things? 100%. Yeah, I get that. And one, one, thing, I, one thing I'll add to that, Ab absolutely, I agree. And that's another, you know, often typically associated trait of conditions like dyspraxia, but again, it's similar conditions too, struggling socially. And absolutely, you know, I struggled socially when I was younger. I was someone who had like maybe one close friend. I really massively struggled in groups. Um, 
Um, but, you know, today, you know, your brother does sales. I do fundraising, which absolutely has a direct sales element to it. Mm-hmm. And you, we, can, we can still succeed. So like any you know, neurodiverse condition, you know, they, they don't mean you can't succeed. You kind of mm. find your own way. And there can absolutely be positive strengths. And I guess, without knowing your brother, but I guess one of the many reasons why he might succeed is because of empathy and lots of people mm. conditions like ours all of us three here today are expected conditions we are often mm. people like us often have are associated with having great empathy yeah yeah he would you know you'd sort of he's huge he's massive right but he would you class him as a gentle giant do you yeah. know what i mean so people like him so that's a really good thing people are like man i would work for him because you know, he's got he he's exactly that. He's he's empathetic to people and he can really work in with him and people like him because of that. You know, he's not one of those salespeople who would, you know, <laughs> you know, be like trying to push a sale onto you. He builds he's really good at building relationships and but he's also he's, immediately likable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, you know. So I think that works in his favor it definitely works in his favor in what he does absolutely that's a gift totally 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 so you know moving on from what we were saying now what is it that you think society doesn't understand about dyspraxia so i think we've sort of covered a little bit in regards to we can see there's some really great things here but how do how can society you know, understand those things. Sure, absolutely. Well, firstly, I would say what surprises a lot of people is officially dyspraxia is thought to affect between five to six percent of a population. Um, oh, wow. You can easily find that fact online, <laughs> and people are very surprised by that because that's actually more than conditions like autism, which you know have so much greater awareness. Um, and breaking that figure down, that means the 5%, 5 to 6% figure means typically in every classroom, so every school classroom of 30, there is likely to be at least one uh, student, people, who has conditioned dyspraxia. Now, they may not, I guess they probably won't be diagnosed, uh, but that really shows you how much more common the condition is than many people, many people realise. I would say also... I'm someone who, as I talked about, I've done lots of dyspraxia awareness raising for like more than a decade, probably like 12, 13 years now. And even now, occasionally, when I mention the word dyspraxia to people, occasionally someone replies with, do you mean dyslexia? Which is just bizarre. Um, Mm. No, absolutely not. You know, dyspraxia is its own standalone condition. Yes, it relates to these conditions, but it's its own condition in itself. And I would say with dyspraxia, answering the question to what you don't understand, there's still people who have heard of it, um, because more and more people have heard of it nowadays, even though their knowledge isn't great. It does come down to the clumsiness thing. They have perception of what some of dyspraxia looks like uh, or how they might be socially. Um, but it can be so much more than that. Like I said before about like, too many cross wires in the brain. Um, processing thoughts. You know, myself, I'm chairman of Sprats Foundation. I've got experience running a business. I'm chairman, it sounds like I'm bragging, I'm not. You know, I'm chairman of Europe's largest professional fundraising event. I've been elected in politics before. I've multiple, I've run a business, multiple things. Um, So I can do lots of the complicated things. But for me, lots of the simplest things are the most challenging. And probably day to day, I live independently where I speak to you from now. but, you know, still for me, lots of the things many people just take for granted as really simple things are the things I often struggle with. Um, and, you know, you get people, again, it's not unique to dyspraxia, conditions like yours and others as well. People have this perception of what someone looks like if they're disabled, which, again, is un- a lot of it's unintended ignorance. So I think really answering a question, you know, dyspraxia is a spectrum. And one person who used to serve alongside on the dyspraxia nation board with me, um, used a phrase, phrase I'd never heard of before. When you met one person with dyspraxia, I think we've just no to the others I mentioned. Autism, dyspraxia. Am I back? Am I back? 
Yeah, yeah, you're back, yeah. my friend. You're back. back. You're back. It's just coming a bit in and out, but you cut out part. You cut cut out part way through the saying that you. Were... <laughs> you were saying you said you've met one dyspraxic person. Okay. And I'm assuming you've met one dyspraxic person, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you've met. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Which sounds quite simple and well, i think mm. that's partly why raising awareness is, is quite difficult because it is sort of uh, we're having a I few we're having technical a... difficulties there hey jonathan just out of curiosity do you have many other tabs open on your computer yeah. if you close down some of those tabs yeah. sometimes that can make it a little bit better mm -hmm. no this is the only one open. Oh, okay. Okay. So you just must have a bad <laughs> connection there. <laughs> well, we'll put it down to nah, the cold it's the only, weather, it's mate. It's only a tab open at present. Oh, that's all right, mate. That's okay. That's okay. Cool, cool, cool. But, you know, out of curiosity... Do you like, blame, you... blame it on something else? Yeah, because you're my only tab yeah, open. Yeah. Your best tab open I'll, yeah. I'll blame it on the cold weather over there, mate. That's the reason why it's, like, really crap at the moment. But it's all good, mate. It's You're good. doing really well. Um... Now, where would you like to see the conversation go? Sure. So in terms of dyspraxia, and again, this is something I know particularly from my role with Dyspraxia Foundation. Yes, people get in touch with us for all kinds of reasons, you know, whether it's childhood things, parenting, relationships, all sorts of things. But workplace seems to be a huge thing employment seems to be a huge thing uh in terms of lots of people you know they might get a job of course in many cases they do get a job but for lots of people holding down a job is so difficult and i've met many people over years who have really had like horror stories in employment um you know they've gone from one job to another job to another job uh and often i think it's not necessarily employers being outright bad employers it's they're not necessarily not knowing how gone again i know i can see i don't know if you can hear me can you hear me yeah 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 all yep. good can you hear me okay can you hear me now i'm back yep okay apologies i'm not sure why we're having difficulties uh, but i was say Okay, fine. But I would say in the workplace, it's really difficult for lots of people holding down jobs, lots of people knowing how to talk about their condition and how to, you know, I suppose, put across the positive straight traits whilst being realistic about the difficulties they may face. And, you know, nowadays we live in a world where people are talking about EDI, equality, or equity, diversity, inclusion all the time. Um, but actually, I feel like lots of workplaces aren't set up still for lots of people who are neurodiverse. And in this day and age, you know, especially in the last few years, what's happened in the world, you know, flexible working has become a far greater thing nowadays. And I still believe, again, this me speaking personally, but I believe there are still lots of workplaces which have rules they don't need to have uh, in terms of you know, like a one size fits all. And this idea that everyone has to start working at the same time, or everyone has to, you know, follow the exact same rules, I don't think it's always right. So I think absolutely one thing. Uh, we would like outcomes to be greater right, in terms of employment. People holding down, being able, being able to hold down jobs greater and having genuinely more supportive employers. And of course, to be more supportive, I think employers should make a greater duty of looking into conditions and finding out how they can actually Education. affect them, what they can do to best support them and retain them too, retain them. Because, you know, often people with conditions like ours, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, whatever, autism, whatever, often can prove to be really great and really loyal employers. And I mentioned my job in politics. Um, when I left that job, I decided to move into fundraising. And what I did, I actually uh, pitched this job, so it wasn't even a vacancy. Um, I pitched and I created a business case. At the time, I didn't think much of this. But because I wanted my experience, how I felt to be different to my political job, I put that newspaper feature I mentioned to you before, I put that in front of the chief executive and my camera's gone again. Oh, um, okay, yeah, my camera mate. went again. What, so I put this newspaper feature, in front, I put it in front of the chief executive. Then as soon as I joined, he shared this newspaper feature with my new colleagues. That 
had such a powerful effect. And I'm not saying to everyone, write a newspaper feature. And of course, not everyone will even get a newspaper. But the fact that something was in writing and my colleagues saw it from day one, I still attribute a decade later to be one of the best things I ever did. Because straight away, I think there's something about things being in writing, which have a really powerful effect. So my colleagues from day one had an idea. I had this condition and it might affect me this way or that way. So understanding was greater. And I felt this job was still, my four years in this job was still probably the happiest experience of my life, work professionally. Because I was treated with such respect, I felt people cared about me and were really interested in me and my confidence rocketed. Mm. I saw I saw Will's uh, face light up when you mentioned uh, the workplace because that's you're in his wheelhouse now. Um, but yeah, it, it is. You know, we we talk a lot about that. It, it's it's um, it, you know, I, I find every neurodivergent pe person I meet from all over many different spectrums, they all want to work and be productive. I think, um, but we, you know, the the workplace as well as many other places in life, but the workplace in particular can be quite difficult when it's. And I up. think probably like. Yeah, we want to work, but we want to be given opportunities. You know, we want to be given opportunities where we can prove what we can do or, you know, maybe we don't do it at the same level as someone else, but we still can do it. You know, um, I remember if we're talking about, so say, for example, in education, there's been a few times where I've said, look, I'm dyslexic, I'm ADHD, and the teachers turn around and go, look, I'm not just going to give it to you. And it's like, I don't want you to just give it to me. What I want you to do is teach it to me in a way that I understand and support me during that, not just um, think that I'm trying to get out of this because I'm not. I really want to work towards proving what I can do type of thing. And, you know, that's the same in the workplace as well. I think we've got a bit of a bit of a lag there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, my man. Yeah, um, I, I heard that. Yeah, cool. So, I heard that. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. What's that? No, I just said definitely. I just said definitely. I agree with you. Uh, it's just there's so much of a lag. We're sort of like, is he nodding and like, <laughs> waiting to say something and then it's like okay no no he's finished he's finished <laughs> but you know moving on from what we're talking about um what did you find to be the most valuable resources to help you to develop so obviously you know you've connected with the right people that's probably been a really great resource but let's say if there are people listening what could be best for them yeah so I, again, around a decade ago, I, on the side to what I was doing, my, my, main, my main source of income, I, um, I, I, I joined like a network marketing company. Uh, network marketing is like, it's, it's an additional way of earning money. And now this company no longer exists. I'm not going to go into which detail about this company. But basically, I was doing a really, it was basically like a home shopping business I was doing. And the person who introduced me to a business was called a sponsor, not financial. Basically, they're called a sponsor for some reason. It's like a mentor, if you like. And I was 21, 22 there. And they told me, read all these books, like, or at least do all these CDs. It was all like personal development. And at the age of 21, 22, it's quite obvious what it is really but i'd never heard the phrase personal development before and this so i did i bet i was a sponge for knowledge i did everything they told me to do and all this personal development stuff it had a really big effect on me more than anything my mindset um and you know i i was rejoining really getting involved in this business had nothing to do with me having dyspraxia um but i was such a sponge for knowledge and i quickly after listening to all this stuff, it really started to help me think I can kind of find my own path. It's different. It's okay to be different to my peers. You know, it really reaffirmed to me. Dyspraxia, like other conditions, you know, it's not, you can't achieve it. It's, it's, it's often a development delay, uh, but, you know, you can get there in the end. So it talks about goal setting, you know, really knowing what success looks like, leadership, strategic mindset, resilience, facing and fighting back from rejection, and this had such a powerful effect on me. And very quickly I, after that, I decided I wanted to become a leader. Um, 
And so like for like a decade, I kind of wanted to be a leader. I wanted to kind of stand out. And in a way in politics, I was involved in politics, as I mentioned, and I did acquire various leadership roles. Uh, but then in terms of paid leadership roles, I've acquired in more recent years. And I have definitely felt, realized that my dyspraxia has actually been a really positive thing for me in terms of me as leadership roles, because some of the things I've done, even like the most basic thing, ensuring everyone has a voice, asking every single person what they think, asking people what they're grateful for, sharing successes, really active listening. These are just kind of things I've done. I just kind of do. Um, but it's only kind of as I've taken over from my predecessors, fellow board members or whatever have come to me, not just the Spratt or boards as well, have come to me and they've said like they feel they have a voice now. They like how things feel. Now they feel included. And yet no one was saying before they felt excluded. And I really attribute this due to my mindset. So really answering the question, I think for anyone, whether you're neurodiverse or not, but perhaps especially people like ourselves, personal development resources are so much of it online can be really really beneficial um because you know if we're so growing up as i mentioned i often felt different to my peers then in my early 20s i kind of resented that a bit i wanted to be in the same lane as them like treated with the same credibility then i kind of realized i may never achieve i may never in some ways be in the same lane as them, if you like I kind of became more comfortable in terms of standing up in my own lane, but still getting there. And when I do get there and achieve my goals, many of which I have done now, it really arguably means more. So I would say for anyone, particularly perhaps people like ourselves, really investing in yourselves, you know, becoming clear of your goals personally, professionally, really honing in on that, I think is really important. And people with dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, whatever, can be fantastic leaders. There's this myth, I think it is a myth in society, you know, people are born leaders, all leaders are a certain way. And, you know, again, working politics, I did think all leaders are rich, they're all they're really strong and angry in some cases. Absolutely not. We can all be leaders. We can all make things happen for ourselves. So I would really encourage fellow people to spread see other conditions, you know, to really invest in themselves. And just finally, when I say invest, uh, you don't even have to spend money on doing it. You can literally go on things like Spotify or YouTube, type in leadership, type in goal setting, type in strategy, and you'll find so much stuff. I listen to people like Jay Shetty, um, other people, Steve Bartler, all the time. There's many of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that, that's some really good advice, actually, and I think that's really helpful for, um, for people just to be able to see, I suppose, the journey you've taken and how that can possibly help. Listen to some uh, Jay Shetty. He's like a he's got a podcast, right? He's an English guy, right? He has absolutely, yeah. He's Just an English guy that, who lives in America, um, and he's story, story of a monk. Yeah, absolutely. He's an English guy. There's all kinds of people. And just one more thing, I'll say: you don't have to be. It can, he's, he has become very well off, but you don't have to be very well off, you know, to be inspiring. Mm. You know, everyone has, every, all of us have stories to share, whether we are names or not. We all have successes we can talk about in our lives. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. That's a really good point. Now, how would society's um, understanding of, of dyspraxia better help people? You know, so, you know, if you're going into a place and they, they knew... How is that going to better help for us? Yeah. Well, I would say uh, with EDI, which equality or equity, diversity, inclusion, in general, I would say, again, including things like dyspraxia, um, there's actually well, a lot of people don't seem to realise, but there is evidence of this in society. There's an economic business case uh, for taking on people who are neurodiverse and other, other different backgrounds as well. They can make for stronger workforces, you know, greater attention of staff, thinking outside the box. That's a phrase often used in neurodiversity land, but really, you know, different forms of thinking uh, can be really powerful. I think ultimately leads to better decision making too. Um, so I would say, in terms of how society, in understanding dyspraxia in general, better help, uh, I think there'll be more equal opportunities. I think more people will be willing to come forwards and share their story and stand for roles, whether it's you know in lo lo local authorities, councils, parliament, workplaces, um, 
role models. Um, so again, I've talked about, I was someone for years who longed to be a leader uh, and I couldn't find, I, I, I don't think I did find a single openly dyspraxic person who was a leader. Um, mm. And whilst it wasn't a huge issue for me, it was probably quite frustrating. Like the most famous celebrity, if you like, with dyspraxia is Daniel Radcliffe, who's Harry Potter star. Now, oh, obviously he's made lots of money, he's about my age, but you know, personally, I couldn't care less about Harry Potter. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. all good. Okay. Um, personally, I couldn't care less about Harry right, thank you. Personally, I couldn't care less about Harry Potter. You know, secondly, he's an actor. How many people are going to become actors? You know, I was longing for like a neurodiverse leader and I couldn't find someone. Uh, that was kind of quite frustrating. For, it wasn't a huge issue. It was quite frustrating for me. And I guess it did make me think, will I ever be able to become a leader because I can't find someone like me? Um, but of course, if there was greater awareness, greater understanding of dyspraxia, the more people would realise themselves they have dyspraxia, because lots of people don't even realise they've got it, then more people mm. would come forward and talk about it. Mm. And of course, free, that would undoubtedly propel, compel more people to talk about it too and share their vulnerabilities too. One thing I'll add, in my first fundraising job, the one I pitched for, I talked about before, the chief executive, one of the best people I met, he encouraged me to show more vulnerability. And I thought I was showing vulnerability by talking about dyspraxia, um, but I was very like strong-willed, strong-minded, I still am. But I was probably more, less, well I was, I think less willing perhaps to talk about my weaknesses, if you like. Anyway, he encouraged me to show more vulnerability. I kind of didn't really understand that at the time. It wasn't until a few years later, where in my personal life, things became a bit messier. I ended up realizing the power of vulnerability because when I recovered from this difficult time in my personal life um, and I shared my story, I suddenly realized the power of vulnerability and every single person, whether they're neurodiverse or not, we all have vulnerabilities and people speaking out ultimately, you know, encourages more people to do that and feel safe too. And that can lead to so many so much, so much change happening in a workplace and society in general. So that's quite a long and waffly answer, but ultimately I would say talking out and not being afraid to talk about our vulnerabilities. Yeah, I think when we see more people talking about stuff that, you know, because I think especially with neurodiversity, we're seeing a lot more celebrities talking about it. And, you know, a lot of people do talk about it and say, oh, celebrities, we only hear about the celebrities. But the celebrities do play a role in that. It is bringing awareness to it. But outside of that, having these other leaders like you, you yourself, what you're talking about, that plays a huge role in the, the like society because it's like, oh, man, I know this guy. It's more relatable then because sometimes trying to meet a famous dyslexic person or dyspraxic person can be very hard to get to those people. Um, trust me, I've tried. It's very difficult, eh? Uh, hey, was, that's not to say that I never will. Sorry, Fredon John. I, was, yeah. I, you know, I would I would certainly, you know, in, uh, um, at the very least locally point you out as a, as a, a um, uh, not, the word's not attainable, but an accessible leader, you know, yeah. um, over, over this side of the pond. But, um, uh, I think also just this conversational thing that we're doing now, you know, it's, mm. um, it's, it's just having a chat about it and being really open. Well, um, the, we, the, the, the thing is, is like, I was really excited coming into this because I was like, I really want to learn more about this. I, and look, I'm going to say it from this point, whenever I've heard this in front of something, I'm straight away, I'm thinking, has that got to do with dyslexia? Like you were talking about before, like, do people are like, hey, is, and I would used to be like, what has this got to do with dyslexia? So, you know, being able to learn more about it and being like, oh, this is just, it's really got nothing to do with dyslexia to tell you the truth. It's a whole thing within itself. Um, that's really opened my mind and just being able to hear you talk about that. And, you know, I sit here thinking, oh, my God, this is certain family members that I know who, you mm. know, we never had a name for what that was. Now mm. we do type of thing, if that makes sense. 
And it makes me want to uh, do more around this particular topic mm -hmm. because we haven't done a lot yet. Um, and, I've, and I've learned a lot. Totally, totally. Just waiting for the lag. Is it's it good, good to hear. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, mate. You're good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> so it's just with this lag. It's so hard to. Yeah. No. 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 I just. Uh, frustrating. Frustrating. Isn't it? Yeah. No. No. All good. But you know, thank you so much for coming on. Now. If anyone was interested in connecting with you or to learn more, what where would you say would be the best place to connect with you? Yeah. If people want to connect with me and find out about my work, uh, what individually speaking, they can find me on LinkedIn. That's Jonathan Levy. Um, I connected with you, of course, via LinkedIn as well. Uh, so you can find me on there. Uh, the charity I'm chair of, uh, we support people in the UK, so not Australia, but nevertheless, we are used, our resources are looked at by people all across the world. The Spraxia Foundation, our website is to spraxiafoundation.org.uk. Of course, we're on the usual social media platforms too, as well. And I'll just say, you know, if you want to find out more about dyspraxia in general, regardless of where you're based, you know, if you look up dyspraxia online, you will find a wealth of resources. As I've talked about today, dyspraxia is much more common than people think. And there's lots of success stories, you know, lots of positive traits. Life can certainly be difficult for conditions like our people with conditions like ours, but with lots of positive reasons as well, lots of positive attributes too. But yeah, dyspraxiafoundation.org.uk is the charities website and myself, Jonathan Levy, I can be found on LinkedIn. Nice. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Bodon John, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we sign off for the year? Uh, I think I may go and talk to the person who diagnosed me after this. Oh, <laughs> you know, really? Yeah, yeah. Why is that? Uh, some 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 interesting relatable stuff in here that I didn't know about. So. Oh, you I'm think you might be dyspraxic? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, like we said, there's some crossover, so maybe maybe not, but it might be worth looking into. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Mm. Sorry, out of curiosity, this was just a question I had before we finish up. Did mm. you? Was it difficult for you for driving? Or do you drive? Yeah. Just wait for that. I, or myself. Yeah. I actually can't answer your question. I actually, can't. yeah. If that's a question for me, I actually, I actually can't drive. I say I can't drive. The truth is, I always knew. I was absolutely certain. Other people told me to uh, learn to drive because my coordination is so poor would be extremely difficult. Um, but because of my first job, it was close to where I lived. I didn't need to drive. I kind of put it off and put it off and put it off. And the place I live in happens to have good transport links anyway. Um, so it's just one of those things. The order I've got, I've never really felt I needed to. And I feel like now, if I, if I was to learn to drive now, um, I could try in an automatic, which I might might be easier for me, but I think I'd still struggle. And I think the order I've got, the more frustrating it would be if I did try and learn now, because I'm kind of used mm. to not managing. But yeah, lots of people just perhaps could do struggle to drive. I don't mm. manage to pass. But then equally, there are some people who do manage to pass. But yeah, I've never really tried to learn because I, I was certain I wouldn't succeed. But it's never been an issue for me. I'm in exactly the same boat. So. Yeah, no, it's interesting because my brother... He, he picked it up pretty well. He seemed, from what I can remember, that was a long time ago, but he seemed to pick it up pretty well. So I think that's a really good example of you meet one dyspraxic person, you've met one dyspraxic person, we're all different type of thing. But in saying that as well, whereabouts you live in like the world, I got to admit, um, there's a lot of people who don't have driver's license because public transport is just more commonly used. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Anyway, let's sign off for the year. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming on the podcast today. My name's Will Wheeler. Join with my main man, Photon John. This is the Open Hearted Podcast signing off for the year until next time, until 2024. Till next time. See ya. Welcome to the open hearted. Oh, podcast. shit. <laughs>